when I was teaching on the SEP, we had nothing like such alumni events. And uh, I was noting to myself on the way down here, a business school can only be as good uh, as our alumni are loyal. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, yes, this question, I guess it's the question that, uh, in a sense, business schools uh, were set up to try and find an answer to. Uh, and we've been trying for about 100, 100 years. One, you know, I'm, I'm an alumnus of the Wharton School. I think Wharton, the first business school, probably thought that this was, was one of the most germane questions to which we need to, to find answers. And it's proving remarkably uh, hard to, to find answers. Uh, I came across a wonderful uh, quote from, from Warren Buffett the other day that, in a sense, formed the, the thought that I want to expand upon in, in my talk over the next half hour or so. He said, I've often felt there might be more to be gained by studying business failures rather than business successes. In my business, we try to study where people go astray and why things don't work. If my job was to pick a group of 10 stocks in the, Dow jo in the Dow Jones average that would outperform the average itself, I would probably not start by picking the 10 best. Instead, I would try to pick the 10 or 15 worst performers and remove them from the sample and work with the residuals. And he calls this an inversion process. Start out with failure and then engineer its removal. Uh, now, of course, we shouldn't be too snooty about this principle because we ourselves are the result of just such a process, the process uh, of evolution. It works by, if you like, a, a process of random variation and rather rigorous or ruthless selection. And it filters out all those genetic mutations uh, that fail uh, to produce offspring. So in a sense, it's the same concept of an inversion a process. Science, too, works, I think, to an inversion a process. We cannot prove a theory, but we can certainly refute a theory. And therefore, science is a model of disproof, and knowledge is what's left over after we've refuted all the falsehoods we can. Think about religion. Religions define virtue. Most religions define virtue most of the time as the absence of sin. And therefore, a large part of religious philosophy is specifying what counts as sinfulness. And a good life is one where we abstain uh, from sin. Democracy is a political principle uh, that can remove governments without bloodshed, which is also an example of the inversion process. And capitalism is the economic process uh, or principle whereby bad ideas go bankrupt faster than in any other system. So I want to suggest that corporate performance is, in a sense, strongly related to the pace at which we can unlearn uh, falsehoods and illusions of various forms of bias and self-deception. And that, in a sense, the strategy process it's not so much about discovering new insights, wonderful though that is, and difficult though that is. It's just as much perhaps around misconceptions and falsehoods and things that hold us back. One of you was referring a moment ago to interference factors, the notion of performance being potential less interference factors. So, to try and give this idea a bit of meat, I'm going to use this uh, model which formed the heart of the book that, uh, that David mentioned. And it, it's, it's a picture of firms in competition. We've got, we've got a green firm and we've got a yellow firm. And it's a Venn diagram. And the green firm uh, is made up, if you like, of a belief system. All of its choices and biases and actions and processes and structures are the manifestation of a theory as to how the world works. This may be about 
how the future will be different. It may be a theory of leadership that informs its culture. It may be a model as to how its customers and clients make choices. But everything that happens in the firm is, in some sense, the outflow of a particular belief system or set of assumptions. And the green firm, too, the yellow firm, too, will have its own set of assumptions. There'll be a huge overlap area, won't there? We live in the same world. Uh, we go to the same business schools. Uh, we recruit from the same universities, we read the same newspapers, uh, we study the same sciences, and it's no wonder that so many of the beliefs that drive our actions are the same across an industry. But that therefore cannot be the answer to our question. Those beliefs cannot be the answer to our question. Those beliefs cancel out in some sense. This middle area cannot be the basis for green winning or losing against yellow. The winning or the losing comes from those beliefs that are unique to that business. So these beliefs here for green are the beliefs that it believes to be true and yellow believes to be false. And this small segment here are the beliefs that yellow believes to be true and green believes to be false. And those are the strategies of the business. Imagine if those businesses were to exchange their plans and strategies and they were to read their competitors' plans and put a tick against all the things they thought were true and sensible and wise, and a cross where they thought their competitor had got it wrong, and vice versa. Our strategy is the crosses that our competitors put on our plans. Everything else goes away. And that's why I think when we're thinking strategically, we're thinking about the X's. We're thinking about the beliefs that we hold that guide our actions, that we believe to be true that our competitors believe to be false. Do you think I'm onto something here? The problem is that we don't know which of our beliefs are true or false, and that's the point of learning. That's why business schools exist, in a way, to move this line down, to ensure that we're operating more coherently around a true model of the world rather than a false model. But of course, as the world changes, things that were once true become false. So the line has a natural upward tendency as things become obsolete. So in a sense, every firm has four sets of propositions or beliefs or assumptions that drive its behavior. The valuable ones are called uncommon sense. Sense because they're true, uncommon because they're proprietary to that firm. This is the magic, this is what strategy, this is what being in business is about. It's about expanding this valuable source of proprietary knowledge. The dangerous stuff is this. It's special to us, but it's flawed in some sense, and that's what holds us back. There's a lot of common sense in the world. Knowledge, scientific knowledge is a kind of common sense. It's true, and it's shared. But there's also, I would suggest, an awful lot of common nonsense. A large part of what you were feeding back a moment ago was your view as to where the common nonsense might lie, where we're so easily misled or mistaken. And of course, the Buffett principle is that performance depends upon a faster removal of common nonsense than our competitors are capable of. The great Mark Twain, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So there are four processes by which the world is enriched. There's a discovery process where we bring in new insights to feed our uncommon sense. But there's also discarding that toxic material that only we believe in. There's also a stealing or a neutralizing from others, whether from competitors or other firms. So in a sense, we're, we're incorporating others' discoveries into our own business model, our own organizational model. And there's also this important principle that I want to sort of specialize on in the next few moments of marooning, that is being the first firm in the industry to get out of a falsehood that everyone believes in, to remove the common nonsense and make it the pro property of our, of our competitors. And this, of course, is a process of unlearning in some sense. So why do some companies consistently outperform their competitors? One answer might be they possess less common nonsense. So now I want to think about where the common nonsense might be. 
Um, there are lots of frustrated observations of modern business life, the workplace, many of them from London Business School, that suggest that something is unsatisfactory in the workplace and has been for some time. Um, do you remember Gareth Morgan's fav famous phrase from 30 or 40 years ago, the psychic prison? When I read it, it sort of stayed with me. Then, of course, there's the wonderful Charles Handy, one of the greatest professors who ever worked in this place. The Hungry Spirit and the Empty Raincoat. Some of you will have read those two remarkable books. And then there's Samantha Gauchal's observation that many of us as managers and leaders live the life of, at least at work, of busy fools. Too, too busy. Anyone read this wonderful book called Deep Work? Don't you think it's a wonderful book? I only came across it last year, but it's really how we can somehow escape from the frenetic activity that defines corporate life today. Here are some fashionable oxymorons. These are kind of, these are kind of intellectual cheating or operating in bad faith. Uh, we put an adjective that's a good word in front of a notion that's rather more shady in the hope uh, that we can uh, sort of square the circle. These circles tend not to be squareable and I trust the, ni the noun any day rather than the adjective. But these again suggest that we're uncomfortable with life at work in the way that it's currently defined. Um, other indications that all is not well in the corporate world. I realize I'm dealing more with large corporations than some of the startups and ventures and smaller businesses that some of you work for. You're, in a sense, you still have this to come as you grow your business and adopt these principles, right? Uh, so, Mandra Goshal, I think, is, is the person who's written most elegantly about what might be an alternative to the current hierarchical bureaucratic corporation that he calls the individualized corporation. And of course, some of you may have been taught uh, by Sumantra, but uh, this is a wonderful book, of course. And then Charles Handy again, and his invention a long, long time ago of the Shamrock Corp Corporation, or the Shamrock Organization, which is slowly but surely becoming more of a model of how we work. And Gary Hamill's whole concept in Beyond Management, the post-managerial enterprise. So, all this, these kinds of words, are suggesting that something is, something is amiss. And I want to suggest that the common theme, the, the common culprit, is what might be called managerialism. Managerialism was invented, certainly in the form that we all experience it, at the end of the 19th century, as a way of taking what were essentially unskilled men, and it was mainly men, off the land into these newly industrializing organizations, the assembly line principle and so on. And these men, through this technology of, co of control and coordination, were making quite complex objects like cars uh, in a highly efficient way, or in a far more efficient way than work it had ever been done before. But I think Gary Hamill points out that of all the 19th century technologies, the, te the social technology of managerialism has probably changed less than any other. And for him, it's become something of a burden at work. And I think it's based upon six ideas or six principles. And we can all see the merit of these ideas. But we can also see that carried to an extreme, they become a very uncomfortable set of principles under which to work. A hierarchy, a structure, a reporting relationship, a command structure, um, the standardization of process, the belief that there is a right way to do things, compliance with a certain kind of process requirement, specialization of task, taking a big task, the corporate task, and dividing it into one person sized pieces, a kind of division of labor principle. The planning of outcomes, 
the belief that if we're to be rational, we need to have seen the future before we enact it. Uh, motivation uh, by, by money, above all, people are intrinsically lazy, and that money is the best way of bribing them to behave uh, in a more conscientious uh, manner. And singularity or unanimity around vision and values, that we need alignment, as the phrase goes. Now, briefly, I'm going to take each of these pillars and suggest an alternative. Okay. So, first pillar, hierarchy. I think it's based upon the idea that power is best expressed by a few rather than by many, uh, and that the elite is wiser than the crowd. Uh, and, and it may be. There must be many situations where we want expertise. But my suspicion is that too many decisions in business, too many judgments in business, are made by quite a small coterie uh, at the top of the organization. And there are some things, and uh, Sir, Rick, Sir Rick in his wonderful book, The Wisdom of the Crowd, would suggest there are perhaps more things than uh, that we're inclined to, to admit to, are better judged and solved by, by a majority. Hierarchy is also the main source of, if you like, immoral behavior. Immoral behavior is where we treat one another as means to an end and not as ends in ourselves. It's a kind of transaction, overly transactional behavior where the organization, the health of the organization, the collective, becomes the end and we are simply resources, human resources, or as economists call us, factors of production, inputs. A better phrase would be resourceful humans, but not all organizations are designed around the principle of resourceful, thoughtful uh, humans. Um, imagine an organization that were designed uh, as a kingdom of ends in the way that Kant defines a kingdom of ends, where we treat one another as ends rather than as means. John Rawls invented a wonderful mechanism for thinking in practical terms about how this might be done. And he called it thinking behind a veil of ignorance. When we're behind a veil of ignorance, we do not know our lot in life. We don't know whether we're going to be one of the lucky ones in life or one of the less fortunate ones. We don't know what our intelligence will be. We don't know where we're going to end up. And therefore, we're seeing a fair system through the eyes of humans generally rather than the position we find ourselves in the world as is. In this case, rather privileged, I suspect. Under those conditions, how would fair inequality be defined? Rawls suggested that behind a veil of ignorance, human beings would accept as much inequality as would benefit everybody. And my suspicion is that if we were to do this as an experiment within a firm, how would we design the principles by which we work in a firm? We would end up with a very, very enlightened set of principles that people would accept as humans, as I say, not knowing whether they're one of the lucky ones or one of the less lucky ones. Standardization of process. There is a right way to do something, what might be called the curse of best practice. I think best practice is the most toxic idea that business schools have injected into the world and has destroyed enormous amounts of wealth. If you think about it, best practice is defined as best practice for us all in any industry. It's not best practice for one firm and not for another. It's best practice. It's best for all of us. And therefore, the pursuit of best practice inevitably means that we will converge upon a common way of working. And we commoditize our own thoughts. Samantha used to say, we're not paid to go to work to make happen what's going to happen anyway. We're made to make a difference, to find unique practices, advanced beliefs, proprietary knowledge. That's why business is the most progressive activity, the most progressive institution in the world. It only works because it requires thinking, not thoughting. Anything that betrays the notion that there's a formula for success in business is a kind of thoughting. It's a derived, second-hand kind of thought thinking. In business, we're paid to think. In other words, we're inclined to make the category mistake of seeing that business is a puzzle where there's a right answer. There is 
a winning formula, uh, rather like cooking, where there are recipes. Whereas actually, business is a game, and there are emergent properties to winning at a game. It cannot be, winning at chess cannot be planned. It's played. We learn chess by playing it. This is um, my notion of the modern corporation. Um, I'm not saying that these things are wholly bad, but I am saying if they occupy more than about 75% of our activity at work, then something's gone wrong in the enterprise. I've talked a bit about best practice. Um, it's uh, Rommelt at, at Stanford who defines operational, the pursuit of operational excellence as doorknob polishing. You know, we're paid to do more than polish no doorknobs at work. We really are. Um, budgeting. Where did that thought come from? Where did that thought come from? It takes an inordinate amount of time for no obvious purpose. The Swiss, by the way, anyone from Switzerland in the room? The Swiss are ahead on this, aren't they? Beyond Budgeting Roundtable and the wonderful people. UBS, anyone at UBS? UBS Wealth Management? They inquired, what is the cost of the budgeting exercise? And they, they did it through timesheets, and there's rather well-paid uh, executives in UBS, and they calculated the cost of the budgeting exercise at about 45 million uh, pounds a year. And uh, we had the, um, the finance director of UBS talking to us at the school not so long ago, talking about the post-budgeting uh, post world. And of course, someone said, well, you know, how many families, how many high net worth families do we have to switch from Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank to pay for this investment? I think it was 235 families who would need to be loyal to UBS for 10 years. That would just cover the cost. And then, of course, someone said, why would a family change its allegiance from Deutsche Bank to UBS on the basis of the fact that we go through this 45 million pounds worth of budgeting? And that no one could think of any reason, so they stopped budgeting. And one of the finance professors in the school asked uh, the finance director of UBS, well, you know, you're required, you know, you have a fiduciary duty to put data uh, into the capital markets to help people uh, see your future and, you know, analyze and evaluate your, your worth. Uh, what do you say? And he said, I say 10%. <laughs> and uh, the finance professor pushed back and said, yeah, but 10% of what? He said, well, 10% of anything you care to name. 10% <laughs> growth in sales, 10% return on assets, 10% margins. And there was a puzzled look on our faces. And he said, but everybody else says 10%. But they spend 45 million to get to that number. <laughs> so why don't we just pump the number out as though we've done the work behind it? But there's a serious idea there, isn't it? We can very easily lull ourselves into a habit that just because everybody else does it, and just because we've always done it, that somehow it produces wealth for the world. Pillar three, specialization of tasks. Why is the work package, the unit of work, one person sized and called a job? There's so much evidence that we're better in small teams of diverse and complementary skills. If there were an auction, let's say in your business, if it were to be announced that come tomorrow evening, the business had been closed down and, and it was up for sale. And as an ex-employee now of this business, you had the rights in three weeks' time in an open Dutch-style auction to bid for any of the assets. My guess is about 10 to 20 percent of the employees of most businesses would be intrigued by this invitation and would come together in groups of somewhere between five and seven individuals, individuals who just loved working with one another, were inspired by those other six or seven. They would come together in teams and they would bid for the bits of the business that everyone knew had future value stamped over them. My suspicion is that 15% would bid in teams of five for about 15% of the assets. And in five years' time, those businesses would be many, many times the worth of the existing business if carried forward under its own 
current. In other words, good people find good people. We choose the leaders we want to work for. The notion of appointing leaders is ridiculous. It's very, very difficult to judge the quality of a leader if you're above that leader, so to speak, in the organization. But if you've worked with that person and have found inspiration for that person and find that you're better for working with or for that person, okay, that's where the leaders are found. I think it's W.L. Gore that has put this principle into practice. You're a leader if people show up at your meetings. You have an idea people rally to that idea, there's the business unit. It comes from below. It bubbles up. The notion of self-appointed communities of responsibility. We find one another. We give rights to ourselves to invest the firm's resources. In W.L. Gore, you pay what you think you're, you pay yourself as a salary what you think you're worth. But then you have to tell your peers what you think you're worth. And as a result, people set a rather lower level than their competitors were set on their value because they're human, they're modest, they don't want to be show-offs. But that way of extending far, far greater trust uh, is a very interesting, I think, thought experiment. I won't stay with Robert Nozick's famous framework for utopia, but that would be the philosophical observation as how societies should organize on this similar principle of finding oneself in the communities that one would like to belong to. This notion of learning from one another um, finds huge validation in this study recently, a serious study, as to how, as adults, we learn. And that second one of job rotation and assignments is a very interesting one, isn't it? That simply mixing, talking. I think that it's sometimes called the five S's, isn't it? Swaps in firms. That any pair of individuals have the right to swap their responsibilities for as long as they want or as short as they want. Uh, secondments, shadowing others, sabbaticals, uh, with Rolls-Royce, I try to encourage task twinning, that any pair or trio of people in the organization, wherever they were in Rolls-Royce, would have the right to combine their work into a larger work package, typically across boundaries, and how that would grow, if you like, this principle of, of job rotation that accelerated learning and finding yourself in, in teams of your own choosing rather than finding yourself in business uh, units uh, of somebody else's appointment. Okay. Pillar four, the planning of outcomes, the idea that success uh, can be planned meticulously. You would have thought this would have died with the death of socialism in 1989, wouldn't you? And all of Hayek's work on planning as what he called the fatal conceit, the somehow that uh, the future can be mapped and predicted and controlled. It's a kind of belief in our own clairvoyance. It's profoundly uh, unscientific. In some respects, business, particularly large corporations, have remained the last redoubt of socialist thinking. I forget who referred to planning as a kind of rain dancing. You know, when the rains come, thank God we danced. If we hadn't been dancing, these rains would never, ever have come. We get a result at the end of the year. Thank God for that result. Imagine how appalling the result would have been if we'd never had a plan. And the fact that in business, you're practical people. We need more activity. John Stopford, I don't know whether John Stopford ran the SEP for probably 12 years when I was involved in teaching on the SEP. So if there's one adjective that defines modern business, it's indecisiveness, over-analysis, the fear of doing anything, however marginal. Business, in some sense, is a numbers game. We bump into the truth, we bump into success, the result of trying more things than our competitors. We're willing, as you were saying earlier, we, we remove the fear by acting more. Most of our actions will be mistaken and misconceived. It doesn't matter. We bump occasionally into the truth, and those discoveries count as uncommon sense. We give ourselves permission to be much, much more exploratory, to be much, much more active. And of course, contained experimentation 
which in a sense has become the methodology of executive education in London Business School now. We're ahead, we think, in the world of encouraging our clients uh, to design and conduct experiments as the best way of managing uh, performance. Yes, the New Yorker, I didn't realize until I read a couple of weeks ago that since 1920, whenever it was, that the New Yorker was founded, it's had, I think, it, I think I'm right in saying, 18 cartoons in each weekly edition. And to get those 18, they employ 15 freelance cartoonists who submit each week 10 cartoons. So you've got 150 fully fledged cartoons to get to the 15 or 18 that they published. But each of those cartoonists will get to those 10 ideas from 100. So think, I think it's something like 18,000 ideas are required by that small group of freelance cartoonists to get to the 18 that are actually published. Amazon is conducting 10,000 experiments as we speak. Uh, Alibaba even more, I believe. This uh, notion of experimentation, I think, is going to be the flavor very much of uh, business over the, next, uh, over the next 10 years. I'll be very quick. Pillar 5, motivation by money. The idea that uh, we're naturally lazy and that we need to be bribed to perform. It's a kind of Faustian bargain. Increasingly, I think we go to work for much grander reasons. I think many of us find ourselves at work you know, we're motivated by a sense of who we are, our identity, some cause, however ill-defined, that we're, we're serving, the, the, the purpose that we attach to our life, our sense of, of destiny, and some notion of affiliation which is deep in our spirit. We need to feel some degree of belonging, not just to the human race, to, but to smaller units where we can dedicate our, our, our thought and our passions and so on. For our grandparents, most of these needs for identity and, and belonging came probably from family, from the local community, the neighborhood, uh, from the church. Uh, nowadays, it's increasingly coming from the workplace. The workplace is being asked to address quite deep human needs over and above that of simply making uh, a living. And therefore, I'm suspicious that money is any longer the great motivator at work. And it goes back to the error of defining the organization as the end result. I think of organizations as, if you like, legal entities within which individuals can accomplish far more than they ever could alone and find a life worth living. The organization is the, is the element that we design to ensure that those that belong to it lead fulfilling lives, not the other way around. The organization works for the member or the employee whenever we slip into the notion that I work for London Business School rather than London Business School works for me, we make a profound and I think immoral uh, judgment. And I wanted to, yes, a quote, because I found this the other day. This is from uh, Isaiah Berlin, a great uh, British philosopher of the 20th century. These were two people having a conversation. Here's Hertz from the great uh, Russian mid 19th century thinker. He was having a conversation with, with Louis Blanc, the great uh, French uh, uh, committed socialist. Um, and he said to, to Hertzson that human life was a great social duty, that man must always sacrifice himself to society. We can say sacrifice ourselves to our organization that provides employment. And Hertzson asked him why, and Blanc replied, surely the whole purpose and mission of man is the well-being of society. And Herzen retorted, but it will never be attained if everyone makes sacrifices and nobody enjoys himself or herself. <laughs> so finally, last, last slide, unanimity. I really worry about solidarity and consensus and unanimity and alignment. It gives me the absolute heebie-jeebies. Um, solidarity was, of course, a virtue in tribal societies we held together. But the whole of civilization is about individuation. Um, and values, anyway, are plural. There are no virtues that stand alone as purely virtuous. Kindness makes compromises when it's challenged by, let's say, the truth 
or honesty. And this is Berlin's point, that in a plural world of values, we're trying to reconcile in any particular human situation that is morally problematic, we're trying to reconcile seemingly competing uh, values. And I simply wanted to end with one very important reconciliation of two very important values in business. On the left-hand side, we've got the values of being in control, if you like, all those bureaucratic notions, that slide I put up earlier, are on the right. And these, of course, are important. They're very, very important. But they're not so important they should exclude the virtues of creativity and making mistakes and trying things out, experimentation, learning and unlearning. Uh, the right-hand loop. We can start with what we believe to be a winning formula and frame targets and, and metrics and rewards on the basis of that. We understand that. That's managerialism. That's the 19th century uh, technology, so to speak. We're very, very good at that. There isn't a business represented in this room that hasn't in some sense mastered the art of controlling large numbers of people. But too rarely do we query whether this is a winning formula or a losing formula. My first uh, professorial boss at London Business School was a, a wonderful man called Kenneth Simmons. And he pointed out that most of the strategies in the world are by definition losing strategies. If you're in an industry of 10, only one of those firms is winning against all the others. And therefore, the chance of sitting on a winning strategy is about 10% in that case. Therefore, we should always assume that we're sitting on a losing strategy, that our beliefs are somehow falsehoods and recognize our own fallibility as human beings. This is the scientific breakthrough, of course, the recognition of human fallibility. And this means that occasionally, even if it's for just one afternoon each week, we interrogate our winning formula and the assumptions that underpin, underpin it and ask better questions of those ideas and perhaps come up with alternative solutions, remedies, and then have the courage and the time and the resources to experiment in a contained way with those ideas. And then I thought, well, how do we reconcile these two principles? Well, we reconcile them in a sense, quite simply, don't we? We, we, we exercise our skills of being in control over our learning. We start to measure the pace of our learning and our unlearning. We put the accountants on the task of measuring the speed at which we're making mistakes too fast or too slow, almost always too slow. And we start to learn more about how we can be more effectively in control, given the fact that we're employing people nowadays who are brighter than ourselves. So I hope I haven't gone on too long, but I've given you sufficient uh, provocation to ask a few questions around what I'm calling uh, the common uh, nonsense of, of, of managerialism. In my country, the word strive Strive for something has become an insult for the children. They said you're a striver and it's an insult. Mm -hmm. um, where do we put ambition and the desire for achievement and for progress in this scheme? That's a, uh, that's a wonderful question. One of the problems with plans and, and, and targeting generally in business is because we're measured against our targets. The political skill of the great businessman is to get away with the lowest possible target possible. Uh, and it assumes that human nature is unaspirational, that if we can get through life without exercising ourselves too much, that's a so splendid achievement. I don't know about your kids, but my kids have more ambition than I do. I've, there, there's absolutely no shortage in terms of what the young want from their lives and what they expect from each other and what they want from a career. And part of my despair at this managerial world is seeing that so I have six kids, three in their 40s and three in their sort of late 20s. The ones in the 20s are not hanging around long any longer in enterprises. They become very, very frustrated because of their impatience. And they've been brilliantly educated. Of course, they have wonderful parenting. Um, <laughs> and here they are. Um, alarmed at how little responsibility, how little challenge has been put their way. And I don't worry about the aspirations of human beings. Uh, it's the things that, the mundane little habits we've become accustomed to that get in the way of aspiration that worry me. It's this notion, Isaiah Berlin's or Warren Buffett's notion of removing the hindrances 
uh, and just allowing the, the human spirit to flourish. Deloitte did a study four years ago of 45,000 US companies, big and small, over a 50-year time frame to find those companies that had performed uni you know, uniformly, sustainably, at the top, topest level over the 45 years. And they identified 74 companies that they called miracle workers. All of us in the room will recognize half of those 74. Other names I hadn't heard of. So they're not all the, the, the sort of McDonald's type firms. Um, they then looked at what distinguished those 74 miracle workers from the rest. And they formed three rules. The first rule was better rather than cheaper. In other words, the art of business is to find differentiators other than price. The second rule was revenue rather than cost. Grow the top line rather than worrying so much about all the middle lines, the cost lines. Tim Ambler, who is a professor of marketing here, studied how boards in British companies spend their time. 90% of their time is counting the cash and not wondering where the cash comes from. This alarmed him, of course. And the final rule is, in growing revenues, you do it through increasing price rather than increasing volumes. They look very hard for operational excellence or operational efficiency being the reason for success. They couldn't find it. They found no case of what Michael Porter would call overall cost leadership as the explanation for success in business. The art, they didn't quite put it this way. I, I expressed it as the following. Strategy is the art of staying one step ahead of the need to be efficient, which requires the human imagination. Um, and that changed me because in some sense, my life, particularly if I go back to when I was teaching uh, SEPs and ADPs, I think I put huge emphasis on efficiency. My daughter works for James Dyson as one of their senior designers. James would be, and he lives next door to where I live in the south of France, James would be alarmed if he couldn't launch any new product at two and a half times the price of the nearest competitor. In other words, the art of business is to increase cost, not reduce it. Because only by increasing costs if you like, do we have, if you like, the, the mental challenge to find an even higher price to place on it to carry that higher cost? If you made a, if you made a, a commitment next year to increase your prices by 10%, you would have to think through the eyes of your customers. You'd have to think of radically changing the deal you were making with your customers to secure that price rise. It's a kind of cheating to believe that we can win by cutting costs. We do the world and our own imagination a huge disservice, I think, by placing so much emphasis on uh, the cost lines. It's the revenue line that's the difficult one. That's what we go into business to enhance, to make a bigger impact in the world, not to screw down on every cost. If I can put this, London Business School is going through a huge operational efficiency drive at the moment, so you can see where my passion is coming from. <laughs> Harvard Business Review, April 2013, Three Rules of Success. Take it with a pinch of salt, by the way, but as a piece of... Uh, Corporate performance research is the largest ever conducted, much, much bigger than Tom Peters and, and Michael Porter and others in the 70s, 80s and 90s. It's a huge piece of research. It's done by accountants. We have to take it seriously. I found the Dyson example really interesting. Um, for me, I think the people that buy Dyson products, you know, don't question the cost of the fact that they're three times more than the competitor because they are radically different, so much more innovative and they need all of that logically makes sense. I guess my question is yeah. to achieve that scale of innovation and that pace of innovation, it requires presumably significant investment. So I guess that's the question there in terms of, you know, you may be charging a lot, but presumably your costing is significantly higher. And how do you make that policy sustainable
There's a wonderful TED talk, it's one of the best TED talks on business, by Rory Sutherland, a behavioural economist, called Sweat the Small Stuff. Will you watch that next week? Sweat the Small Stuff. Rory Sutherland, he makes the point that, actually one of you made it earlier, that sometimes we're more creative when the constraints are drawn most tightly. The one thing business has to learn from the arts is that artists will typically constrain themselves quite artificially to draw upon their true creativity. The canvas, the pigments, the proscenium arch, the rules, not the rules, but the constraints on what writing a poem consists in, meter, rhythm, rhyme. Uh, they do this artificially because it's when we're squeezed, we're most competitive, we're most creative. And Rory Sutherland's argument is that the boards or the senior teams in business tend to think that big outcomes need big investments. In fact, and the example he gives is the breakthrough in terms of children in Africa. I don't know whether Rajesh talked about this yesterday evening, but children in Africa and the uh, vaccination program by the United Nations. The solution was twofold, that women come together, mothers come together with their young. When you're with many other mums, you have the security that I'm not the only one vaccinating my child. There's this huge sense of being in it together and doing the right thing for your child. But the other thing Sutherland pointed out was that there was a small uh, gift for those who did so. It was a bag of lentils. And Rory said, if, you, if you're a senior uh, third world aid specialist, advising the United Nations on children's health, you're not going to say in an auditorium like this to some of the leading thinkers in this field, I've got the answer, it's the lentils. Mm -hmm. The lentils have done more for child vaccination than any other idea and it was partly because there wasn't a huge budget. If there's a huge budget, you'll spend it. And a very interesting experiment at the senior level in a business might be to take the money away. Perhaps give the money to the young. See how they'd spend millions and see how the seniors with now constrained resources would have to start to think rather than to thought. Sweat the small stuff. It's very funny and it's very brilliant. The other thing, of course, is that capitalism is the device by which it doesn't have to be our money that we invest in our idea. That's the beauty of it. There's no shortage of capital in the world, but there's a huge shortage of creative ideas that merit the investment of that uh, hard-earned capital. We'll always be short of imagination. We're never short of resources in the world. And that's why schools like this exist. It's to enrich the imagination so we can accomplish far, far more with much, much less. We get in life what we pay attention to. And therefore, where we choose to place our gaze is terribly important. This is what accountants should be helping us with. What do we choose to measure? What matters? Gary Hamill's book, What Matters Now, I think is the best book that's ever been written on business. And that early morning uh, gathering, simply seeing each other, sharing our thoughts as to where we want to take the day, um, is very different from are we achieving target, which is a sterile debate, I think. The other notion I think is very important that comes back to that book called Deep Work. One business, sooner or later, I've written quite a bit about this, one business sooner or later in its industry is going to go for the four-day work week. And this is going to be a, an extraordinary success. There's a lot of evidence that we only have a patience for about four days, so to speak, working with others in a collective way. And if we were to open up the weekend to be three days, the Friday wouldn't necessarily be away from work. It may be away from office, but it might be a more productive way of sort of reflecting on the week gone by and what we've picked up and what we've learnt and, again, what matters. And the Sunday will have a bit of space in it 
for us to project forward and say, what needs to happen next week? Where do I need to place my attention? What do I need to achieve? And I just have a feeling that I, I very nearly persuaded KPMG to move towards a four-day work week, certainly on an experimental basis in one, and they got cold feet. But it's, it's going to be, in the, in the market for talent, this is going to be very, very attractive as well. Very, very attractive. Um, and there's quite a lot of, I, I, I wrote about it in, a, in the London Business School Review, it's an article called The Firm of the Future, uh, where I try and provide the evidence for a four-day work week. But that's linked again with different mechanisms for building performance other than the rather anal thing of measuring against a, a, a target. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. <laughs>